I've got a story in the middle that I want to read, and um, so I'll just get started. Oracle at Delphi. You can't ask the oracle at Delphi any old question and expect a good answer. For example, if you ask the oracle what's for dinner, she's going to say food. Not very telling, and then you've gone and wasted your question and embarrassed yourself and have learned nothing. You have to ask the oracle a very precise question. What would you ask the oracle if you could? Perhaps you would ask, what is the meaning of life? In my dream, I wanted to know whether the revolution would eliminate class distinctions and make it so everyone could lead equal lives. This is another poem based on a dream. This is called Horse Dream. I was at my parents' house. I don't know what time it was, maybe the middle of the night. Maybe it was after school, and I, the oldest, was watching my siblings. Maybe I was supposed to make them some food. All I know is there are several horses in the barn, and they all wanted to get out. It was all I could do to keep them in their stalls. In fact, they kept getting out, and me and my sister would have to catch them and coax them back in in some cases by grabbing onto their heads and leading them, our arms around their necks, back into their stalls. Take me. A loud, low, grumbling, rumbling, groaning moan of thunder brought us all outside to say hello to the dark gray sky that stole our dusk. Bang like a cannon exploding, cracking, sonic booming. My sister, the youngest of four, flung her arms wide, stretching up to the sky, and yelled, me, take me. And we all laughed, understanding something outside ourselves which was unexplainable, not comfortable, but funny. Watching a young girl taunting the sky, the gods, if there are any, Take me. Was she ready to leave the world, to leave us behind? To leave high school and her friends behind? To leave the young men killing themselves with alcohol and drugs? Would she sacrifice herself for us? I swear, she also said, not them, take me. Not knowing she would soon lose one male friend after another in the worst way. Their bodies burned by alcohol and the gasoline and fumes of a head-on collision with a tree. The heroin addiction of a lone survivor who would later die of an overdose. Take me, she screamed to no one in particular, and we just laughed. snow was starting to fall and went to the front of her shop to watch it through a window when a woman pulled into the parking lot in a Mercedes SUV. The woman, a platinum blonde in her 40s, was wearing a light blue jogging suit with sparkly snow boots. She came into the shop as Lee began rearranging some things in the front window. The woman asked for directions to some place in the next town over. Lee was tempted to reply with the standard Swamp Yankee answer, you can't get there from here, but uncharacteristically gave thorough directions, even writing them down. That morning, while milking her goats, collecting the morning's eggs, and feeding the horses, Lee had speculated whether she might be ready to retire. Business at the shop had been going downhill for years with the economy. Things were not trickling down, and she and her husband, Gary, were having a harder go of things than when their children had lived with them. Lee thought the woman might be drunk because she was slurring her words and her tongue was sliding in and out of the corner of her mouth as she spoke. 
My name is Betty, the woman said as Lee handed her the directions. And I will be back to buy from you. Sounds great, said Lee, though she didn't think the woman would ever come back. Do you have a card, Betty asked. Sure, just a minute. They're over on my desk, replied Lee, as she went to her desk and gathered up some cards. Here you go, and some for your friends, she added. Betty hesitated, staring at a gorgeous tiger maple drop leaf table from the 1800s. Lee was surprised by how still the woman was and let her stand there staring for several seconds. We just got that in. That can be $2,500, Lee said from behind her desk. Oh, thanks, said Betty. Well, like I said, I'll be back, as she waved bye to Lee on her way out of the shop. Once she was gone, Lee's husband Gary called out from the back office where he was doing paperwork. Another in and out, eh? Directions, Lee replied. Figures. Hey, listen to this. You know how Pfizer got all that office space in New London and how the town bent over backward for them, even going all the way to Supreme Court to use eminent domain to remove people from their homes by the waterfront? Yeah, Lee said. What now? Well, Gary began with a laugh. Now that Pfizer would have to start paying taxes on the property to the city, they're up and moving. No, said Lee in a low voice. They wouldn't. Oh, yes, they would, Gary affirmed. Lee went out to the big room of the shop to finish polishing a bedroom set she had been working on. Gary replayed in his head the conversation he'd had with his daughter that morning. I love your mom and you kids so much. I know you do, Dad. The business is bad, and I agree with what you said the other day. It's not going to get better. The economy isn't going back to how it was. Yeah, I know. Those guys on TV keep saying there's been some slight improvement, but I don't believe it. Sure, look at New York. There's still people who have no power from the hurricane which struck three months ago. And that's because the government doesn't give a shit about people. And they don't have money to fix things because they're spending loads of money on war. So it doesn't make sense for you to spend money on an ad for the shop in that magazine because I don't know what's going to happen by then. Well, you'll still have a website. I mean, in two months' time, you aren't going to sell off all your inventory. The ad will have a link to your website, and you could always say you're having a going out of business sale. I guess so. You know, your mom and I appreciate all you have done for us. I'm happy to help, Dad. Now, what about getting someone in there to tell you what your options would be for renting out part of the shop, or all of it, just to see what they think they could get and how much it would cost you? The roof over the big room leaks. We can't rent it like that. Well, how much would a new roof cost? I don't know. Would it be like 2000 or 10000 I really can't say. Can you get an estimate from someone? Yeah, I guess I could do that. I just am not very good with change. I never have been. Yeah, most people aren't. Change is hard. Maybe we could rent out the garage. Someone could use it for storage. People pay money for those little storage units that are like 10 by 15 or whatever. The garage is like five of those. Yeah, that's a great idea. I just can't lose the house. That house means so much to your mom and me. You know, all you kids grew up there. All those memories. Well, the way to save the house is to save the shop. I mean, even if you rent it out, then you'd have some in income that you could count on every month. If you don't have any income, how can you save the house? I don't know. You have to do what you can to control the change, to have the outcome you want. Otherwise, you aren't going to like the change. You know, you're not going to be able to have any say in what happens if you don't take action now. Yeah, once we get the building paid off, we'll have a lot less expenses and be in better shape. Well, good. So how about I email you the contact information for a couple people who can give you information about renting out part or all of the shop? 
Sounds good. And can you get an estimate for fixing the roof over the big room? Yes. Yeah, I should be able to do that. Lee liked to read the local newspaper at her shop when there were no customers. The number of children on antidepressants has tripled in the past decade to one million, she read. When she turned the page, she saw an ad for Zoloft with cartoon shapes and pastel colors. She noted that the drug was made by Pfizer, the large pharmaceutical corporation headquartered in the next town over. Lee's thoughts drifted to the morning she had recently overheard her husband on the phone with their oldest daughter. Lee had just come in from watering the horses and was making tea for herself in the kitchen. Now, let me say what I have to say, and don't say anything till you, feel, till you hear me out, Gary had said. It will sound worse than it really is. I mean, it's not good, but okay. When I think about suicide, I think how silly it is for me to think like that because of mom and you kids. You know, you all love me so much. How could I possibly hurt you? Lee began weeping quietly. She didn't stick around to hear anymore. She quietly slipped out to the barn, sat on the old futon out there, and wept some more. Everything was changing so dramatically. The barn cat rubbed up against her legs. When, she thought, when he thinks about suicide, he thinks about suicide. Echoes of what she'd heard Gary say repeated in her brain as the gravity of the situation began to sink in. Jesus Christ, we must be really bad off, she thought. She stopped weeping and got up, brushed the hay off her jeans. She hoped her daughter would have good things to tell her father. Lee was polishing a 1920s mahogany dining room table when the same Mercedes SUV pulled up to the shop. Betty came in and sat in a love seat near where Lee was working. You came back, Lee observed. I told you I'd be back, exclaimed Betty. The only thing in the world that makes me happy is spending my husband's money. Lee continued polishing the table. Is that so, she asked. Oh, yes, affirmed Betty. He's a big executive at Pfizer. <laughs> <laughs> Lee pictured school nurses handing out pills to a line of elementary school students of neighborhoods being taken over by the city through eminent domain. The only thing is, he doesn't approve of me spending money just for kicks. Even though I've been diagnosed with bipolar disease and my doctors encourage me to shop till I drop, Robert thinks I should take more medicine. Are you saying that shopping is therapy for you, Lee asked, putting down her paper towels? Yes, exactly, laughed Betty. Well. How can I help you, Betty, inquired Lee. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to buy this love seat, indicated Betty. Only, I will donate it anonymously to the Baptist church in town. They're having a silent auction next week. I plan to buy the love seat back from the church through the auction and then put it in my house. I need you to keep this a secret between us because my husband swore that I could not bring any more furniture into our house this month. Well, I began Lee. Oh, it's fine. You see, I made a little money on the stock market this summer, and we'll use this money on the love seat. That way there's no way my husband will find out I bought it from you. Okay, that sounds like a clever plan. Thank you. I think we're going to be good friends, you and me. Now, I don't want you to undersell anything to me. I like to pay the full value of what I buy, so don't go giving me any deals. I'll try not to. Lee handed Betty her receipt. She thought about trying to interest her in buying more furniture, but couldn't muster up the energy to do so. Things good at Pfizer these days, she asked Betty. Oh yes, always. It's a big company, you know. Huge. Yes. We have a lot of their stock as well, of course. We may retire early. How nice for you. Just then, Lee's husband walked into the shop. He smiled shyly at the women and went into an adjoining room. My husband indicated Lee. Gary, come out here and meet our newest customer. 
Gary came back in the room. This is Betty, said Lee. Her husband is a big executive at Pfizer. Gary frowned. Pfizer? Oh, great. Have they destroyed any more historic neighborhoods? Gary, started Lee. Let me guess, they suckered a different town to give them land to build on tax-free for 10 years. And then when the 10 years is up, they will leave, just like they did here. Ha ha ha. I don't know what you're talking about, mumbled Betty. Come on now, Gary, said Lee, trying to mediate. Don't you read the news, Gary stammered. Pfizer screwed over the city, took over a thousand jobs with them too. Executives like your husband don't care about us. Gary, exclaimed Lee. <laughs> Betty's jaw slowly raised as she stood up so that her mouth closed. She looked at Lee, then at Gary, and began, well, you'd think you might have more respect for a new customer like me. Lady, we don't want your business. Get that straight. Take your dirty Pfizer money and get out of here, Gary yelled, pointing to the door. Betty backed away towards the front of the shop, then turned and walked out. Gary turned pale and sat down. What have I done now, he asked quietly. Lee started laughing. Just a little quiet laughter at first. Gary looked over at her surprised and laughed a little too. Then the two of them were laughing together loudly. Tears came out of Gary's eyes, so he almost didn't know if he was laughing or crying. They laughed so hard they had to force themselves to stop just to breathe. When the laughter settled down, Gary said, Hey, you don't know where I got that love seat from, do you? No, I guess not, answered Lee. It was around the time of the big flood when we were busy, and I never mentioned it. So, where'd you get it? A woman came into the shop and had it in her truck. She said the love seat had been in her house in Fort Trumbull before the eminent domain thing happened and she was forced to move. She never found a place for it in her new house and so brought it in and I bought it. Wow, no way. Well, I'm glad it didn't go into the house of a Pfizer executive. Ha, huh, really. Gary wiped the tears from his eyes, strained to stand up from his chair, walked over to Lee and gave her a kiss on her forehead. words escaped me like shy little birds, afraid to leap out of the nest. One tries to lure with scraps of bread, positive thoughts. In the space between thinking outside the box and living inside one, our, di our dignity diminishes. I have not watched TV on a regular basis for seven years, which has nothing and everything to do with a broken mirror and superstition. Some people don't watch the news because it's sad and depressing. Most people don't have a choice whether or not to deal with harsh realities, whether or not to pay them any attention. Someday I will flap my wings and become a word that escapes my mind. When the prophecies start to come true, poets set themselves on fire and words are not needed. This is called Mother of the World, and uh, I wrote it recently in response to the Newtown, uh, Connecticut shootings, and um, the fact that I saw, you know, so many people were talking about it, and, um, well, I'll just read the poem. Mother of the World. Don't ask me to grieve for these children only. Ask me to grieve for them all. Ask me to grieve for the 16 million who go to bed hungry every night. Ask me to grieve for them all. Ask me to grieve for the 1.6 million who go to sleep without a home every night. Ask me to grieve for them all. Ask me to grieve for the 6 million around the world who die from hunger every year, or the 176 killed by US drones in Pakistan 
Ask me to grieve for them all. You don't have to ask me to mourn for these innocents, for I mourn all the children of this world always, and I am ashamed, and I am grieved. fiction piece called Remote Controlled. Lying in bed that night, the flowery wallpaper made him think of her, and he found it hard to sleep again. It was his own fault. He knew he shouldn't keep watching the screen after the explosions, but he couldn't help himself. He figured his tired eyes were playing tricks on him when he had a vision of the girl walking through the wall like she was stepping into a garden. The flowers in the wallpaper also made him think of home. The blue bonnets, a reflection of the blue sky he loved looking at ever since he was a child. No wonder he had spent so much time flying those remote controlled airplanes. He was like a kid for them. Standing in a green field, his dog at his feet, and nothing between him and long stretches of grass and sky. He would maneuver the plane through the air for hours. Sometimes he'd smoke a joint and pretend he was in the plane, traveling to strange lands. He read one time that watching a bird flying in the sky was a form of meditation. You could connect your soul to the bird's flight and feel a sense of freedom from the experience. Flying the planes was like that. He was not getting enough work then. Construction could be like that, feast or famine. So he started growing for the money. He was up to 70 plants when he got busted. He got off with no convictions, but the lawyer fees broke him. He saw a poster about a $20,000 signing bonus with the army and got himself recruited, flown to a strange land, and given a job. Now he stares at gray and brown landscapes through a computer screen, flies drones thousands of miles away using a keyboard, unmanned aerial vehicles, they call them. He figures that sounds more sophisticated than remote-controlled airplanes, something maybe his ex-girlfriend could respect. He had seen the explosion on his terminal, the clearing of dust and debris, the body of a little girl in a simple dress on the ground, bloodstains which bloomed like dark flowers. Uh, no delicate thing is safe. Shells inevitably become empty the way your brain holds thoughts, or how snails live inside them, temporarily. Living inside a shell, you're protected. No one can see your delicate nature without an act of violent penetration. In a boat on the Caribbean Sea, I saw a man stab a shell and rip out the animal living inside it. I put the shell to my ear heard the ocean whisper, beware. No man is an island, and no delicate thing is safe. Tree says, Tree says, stop. Says, look at me. Says, stand still, up straight. Says, tall. Says, now. Says, yes. Says, more says breathe. Tree says, let your hair down, says laugh, says sway, says do not cut me down. Tree says, it is not your place to know the things the trees know. That's why only the trees know them. Tree says, everything is wind. This is a poem for a painting. A poem for Juan Miro's The Flight of a Bird Over the Plain, number three. The bird is like me. The bird 
becomes me. I fly through the hole in the sky that is blue and leave the brown field behind. I leave my human body behind. Leave science behind. I carry with me a string of eggs. They are black and white like science. I will bring them home to multiply. Red makes it real, makes it bleed. I become the bird, become free. Life is an incomplete sentence. He sent his bird to her, and their birds then communicated their innermost desires and secrets with each other. And this is how they fell in love shyly at first, and without acknowledging it, until you couldn't tell their birds apart from each other 